Thanks so much for coming over here, um, all the way over from, from uh, the other venue and braving the streets of Oxford. Hope it wasn't too scary for you. Um, thanks everyone online as well for, for joining this session. Um, so I hope you've all enjoyed your lunch for those who, of us who are in person. Um, and so my name is Audrey Wagner and I'm the uh, researcher and coordinator with the Nature Based Solutions Initiative and one of the main organizers of this conference. And so I'll just be up here really briefly today to introduce um, the session on governance. Um, and so I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce the chair of the session, Mark Hurons. Um, so Mark is a departmental lecturer and a member of the Land Use and Sustainability Group at the Environmental Change Institute. Um, Mark is interested in addressing interlinked social and environmental challenges through interdisciplinary research. He is broadly engaged with research that in invest, uh, sorry, investigates issues of well-being, inequality, and justice with respect to climate change and natural resource governance. Um, so without further ado, I'll just hand it over to Mark. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you very much for coming and thanks Audrey for all the amazing work you've done organizing it. You humbly said that you're part of the team and um, that's, I'm sure that's true, but you also have been doing an amazing amount of work getting things going behind the scenes. So huge thanks to you um, and for, for helping organize the panel. Um, it's really lovely to see everyone today. Um, we're hoping to have a yeah, really stimulating and provocative, interesting panel on, on governing NBS. I'm not going to take too much time introducing it, but just to kind of say, um, I think a lot of the issues around governing NBS, and by that we mean kind of the decision-making process around nature-based solutions, whose voice is heard, whose interests are being served and being recognized within processes, um, how do conflicts and trade-offs get uh, treated within these processes. Um, and I think the sessions so far have really illuminated many um, governance issues, um, not least in the last, last session. Um, and we're going to hopefully continue that um, rich vein of, of conversation that's been going on. Um, obviously, nature-based solutions don't happen in a vacuum. Um, there's a lot of other things happening um, out there in the world of relevance to those of us who are interested in, in social um, issues, biodiversity loss, climate change. Um, and these kind of schemes, as well as being part of these kind of high level discourses, also land somewhere with quite profound impacts. Um, and these questions of equity and inclusion are really central um, to understanding what's going on. Um, and in a number of different ways, our panelists today are going to kind of speak into those um, issues it, and um, yes yeah, so also to note that uh, I'm kind of chairing the room as it were we have uh, Mary Mulani Mulyani who's chairing the online or, or we're co-chairing together but she's online um, and I'm just going to do without further ado hand over to her to just briefly introduce our speakers today and then we'll get um, straight on into it so thank you very much look forward to your um, yeah participation and uh, yeah Mary are you there Yes, can you hear me? Wonderful. Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mark and Audrey. I will now introduce our four speakers and one discussion in our panel. And to be efficient, I think I will introduce each of them briefly at the, you know, at the same time, instead of at the beginning of each presentation so that we can have more time for our Q&A session later. Firstly, we have Constance McDermott, who is an associate professor and Jackson Senior Research Fellow and leader of the Land Use Governance and Sustainability Program at Environmental Change Institute and Oriel College, Oxford University. Connie has over 30 years experience conducting research and applied work on state, civil society, and market-based approaches to governing forests land use and related supply chains. Connie's work also includes a strong focus on the equity of international conservation initiatives. Today, she will deliver her talk on transforming land use governance, discussing how global targets without equity miss the mark. Secondly, we have Rachel Garrett, an assistant professor of environmental policy at ETH Zurich. She will discuss whether inclusivity can improve the effectiveness of tropical conservation efforts. Rachel's research examines the drivers and impacts of land change, primarily in forest landscape, 
and the effectiveness and equity of forest uh, conservation policies and practices. Her work relates closely with national agriculture and forestry agencies, including those in Embrapa in Brazil. She also works closely with companies advising them on their supply chain policies. Thirdly, we have Kairil Abdini joining us online from Indonesia. He is the Secretary General of Indonesian Academy of Sciences and Senior Lecturer at the University of Indonesia School of Environmental Science. He will deliver his presentation on land use chains and sustainability of the palm oil industry Indonesia case study, questioning how inclusive community-based land and forest rehabilitation actions can strengthen nature-based solution governance. Pak Khairil has 21 years research experience in public policy analysis, including in lowland, swampland, and pitland policy areas. His research also focuses on development study, science, technology, innovation, economic productivity, income, and regional inequality, as well as sustainable development policy. He has worked with several of Indonesia's government institutions, and currently he is a special advisor to the Indonesian government's of Minister of National Development Planning. Our fourth speaker is Eric Kumeh Mensa, who is a research scientist at the Natural Resources Institute, Finland. He will present his reflection on the policy and practice of governance mechanism of the hotspot intervention area in Ghana, focusing on the issue of the tension between promising inclusion and delivering marginalization. Eric's research is at the intersection of critical agrarian studies and political economy, exploring the issue of land as a source of and a basis for addressing inequality in rural Africa. Lastly, we will have our discussion today with Jasper Montana, a research fellow in human geography and a departmental lecturer at Oxford School of Geography and the Environment. Jasper is an environmental social scientist whose research examines the frameworks of governance established to protect biodiversity and enhance human relations with nature. Jasper is particularly interested in the interface between science and policy and enhancing the uptake and application of social science research in decision making from local to global scales. Those are our speakers and our discussion. Thank you and over to you, Mark. Thank you, thank you Mary. And um, I'm going to pass the baton straight to Connie, um, who was our first speaker. Um, so yeah, my, my talk today is based on uh, a paper I've written together with colleagues, some of whom uh, are also on this panel. And it was inspired by many, many discussions we've had based on decades of field research in different parts of the world, um, it, experiencing and reflecting on how we've seen international processes, some of the key international trends in forest and land use governance land in different local places. And I think these reflections have made us increasingly think also that maybe there's a need to transform how, how we address um, land use challenges. And in that, we're not alone. There's a lot of widespread attention to how can we transform land use governance. But at the same time, we've seen along with that, this sort of proliferation of global, ambitious global targets um, and target setting as a means to sort of catalyze action. And based on our observations, the argument we're gonna make is that those targets, if they don't more seriously take into account issues of equity than we have so far, um, are more than likely to miss their mark. So this, you know, this general calls to transform uh, land use. Where do they come from? We all are quite probably quite familiar with this. There's a, a number of different conflicting but interacting challenges that we're facing. One clearly is, you know, that chart with the color, colors showing the rising global emissions um, and the challenge of climate change. We also see uh, lots of concern about growing social inequality. This particular graph in the middle is noticing how land inequality and the distribution of land um, is actually on the rise again. 
And then on the far right, you see the graph addressing um, tropical forest loss, which has been a focus of so much of international land use governance. And this is um, not also showing the kinds of trends people want to see. Another very important thing to notice with these graphs that go up to about, let's say, 2018 or so, is there's not an it's not that immediately obvious where some of the key you know new international environmental conventions and the new initiatives that have been coming along have actually made a major impact on these trends so whether it's 1972 stockholm convention 1992 rio convention we still see see these trends happening so it's arguably frustration over this saying we're not doing enough that we see what looks like a real rise in global ambition to address these problems. So there's been a lot of talk about the um, pledge recently in Glasgow this last year, um, where uh, leaders from over 100 countries pledge that we're serious about this now by 2030, we're gonna stop deforestation and land degradation uh, by 2030. What's notable in these pledges, however, is they're not very specific about how we're going to achieve this and particularly how we're going to achieve it um, given our track record so far. So what I wanted to do to link this into the discussions that have been going on for the last couple of days over nature based solutions is think about well if we think that these problems can be solved through nature based solutions. Um, you know, defined as place-based partnerships between people and nature that are underpinned by biodiversity and implemented by and for local communities and informed by local indigenous knowledge. It's time now to take, you know, a big step back, look at what we've been doing so far and see how it stacks up against this um, definition of a nature-based solution. So are the dominant international strategies up until now and, and those as, that we see coming on the pike to stop deforestation and land degradation compatible with such a definition of NBS. And in particular, we want to focus on who and what do they make visible or what do they obscure and with what implications for equity. So I think in starting to think this through and starting to think of how does this all relate to the target setting issue, I'd like to sort of define what we're thinking about when we say targets um, and the proliferation of targets that I referred to. So a lot of the global targets like zero deforestation or net zero emissions or 30 by 30 that are coming out can be defined as single issue proxies for sustainability that tend to be amenable to quantification, hence the ability to have a quantified tar target, and that are detachable from the norms that are legitimating them. So we also see this not just in terms of biophysical targets, but the way that targets within even say the SDGs are being treated on social issues like the rule of law and sustained per capita growth, economic growth, which is also within the SDGs. So the idea is that you, you need a target that's measurable and quantifiable um, in order to and to, you know, spark um, ambitious action. But you know, these are, I would argue, or we argue, somewhat detached from the norms that legitimate. And the reason why we're doing this, like why are we trying to stop deforestation? Well, you always see along with those sorts of pledges that the, the sort of something about the means and the ends for getting there. So I, in an example of, of what I say, what I mean by end goals as opposed to targets or um, sort of proxies is something like you see in the UNFCCC of a safe operate, operating space for humanity. That, that is an end goal um, and a value, a normative value that we're trying to achieve. You also see in, in many documents, including SDGs, et cetera, commitment to fair, inclusive, and democratic decision-making processes. Now, why do they seem to drop off a lot of times from these targets? Well, one argument is they, they kind of problematize the targets themselves, possibly. If you start taking the means really seriously, how democratic, for example, is it to have 100 leader, over 100 leaders from different you know, countries around the world claiming that they're going to stop deforestation by 2030 without saying how, um, is that really a fair, inclusive, and democratic decision-making process? Just to be um, provocative, we have to ask ourselves that. And so if we start thinking about the ends and the means do matter, and then we have to think about how to balance them, we discussed this in our paper and we decided that it's very hard to do that without talking about equity. So this equity is in fact, you could argue something that every society struggles with. They don't all define it in the same way, but it's something that becomes kind of 
in, um, inevitable in trying to, to gain uh, legitimacy for governing systems. And so increasingly, with, especially within the conservation community, and environmental justice communities, you see a lot of talk about equity having several dimensions, all of which need attention. So one is procedural dimension of equity, that which addresses issues of participation and decision making. You see the discussion about recognition, which is around recognition of different cultures, priorities, and knowledge systems. And then, of course, the distributional equity that we're very familiar with. Are we equitably, equitably distributing the costs and benefits of our interventions? So in our case study, I mean, I'm sorry, in our case study, in our, in our paper, we go over five case studies of what have been some fairly um, large scale um, dominant trends within the sort of international land use and environmental governance arena. One is around legality. So to try to use um, international tools and, and agreements to promote um, the legal trade of timber and to stop illegal logging. So that's one of the case studies. Another is looking at efforts to decentralize. It's you know widely recognized that there's importance to decentralize decision-making to make it more um, equitable as a logic. And then also a lot of initiatives around sustainable supply chain. So we look, for example, at a case of cocoa and of palm oil, um, sustainable supply chains and how those initiatives are playing out in particular local places. And finally, at Brazil's um, much recognized strategies to reduce deforestation, which had quite a bit of success for a while and then have had some um, different outcomes recently. So just to summarize, there's obviously not time to go into all of these case studies, but we did observe certain common trends um, that you might, uh, might think about if you're looking at this from an equity lens. One is who is setting the agenda? Um, typically in these processes, well, it tends to be sort of international and national actors setting the agenda. You see, therefore, um, oftentimes an emphasis on standardization and quantified metrics to measure success. And the emphasis is on transparency and accountability to external actors. Um, a lot of emphasis on external monitoring and control. So what we found is this, that this can, and maybe often has, reinforce certain inequalities in decision-making power and resource access. And it has had pretty limited, as we've talked about, uncertain or very volatile impacts on forest loss. So let me just draw on one of our case studies very um, briefly to illustrate how this might work. So let's look at the case of legality and look at it from first an international lens. So I want to draw on the case of the EU Forest Law Enforcement Governance and Trade Voluntary Partnership Agreements, which generally some of you may be familiar with, involve developing uh, between the EU and, uh, and the partner countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, timber legality assurance systems that involve a legality standard. So legality must be um, sort of simplified and produced on a auditable standard. Um, you see the development of an auditing system and then a system for licensing legal wood. And then once that system is in place, the idea is that the EU will only accept flag T licensed wood to enter the EU. So this seems, you know, quite logical. It seems like a very efficient, perhaps, or, or legible way of ensuring that the EU is only importing um, legal wood. But if we start to lower our gaze to the more national context, I'm going to draw on the case of Ghana also, just to illustrate how things quickly become much more complex. So we were asking, well, what, what and who meets legality standards and is visible to global actors? Um, well, the way that many, um, in fact, dating back to colonial times, a lot of forest laws are written to favor this sort of um, scientific forestry and the production of high value timber, which in many cases is sold for export. Now, what is not uh, meeting legality standards and is invisible to global actors? Um, for example, in Ghana, there's a challenge that farmers outside of, you know, farmers um, who grow native trees on their farms outside of forest reserves do not have legal rights to those trees. Um, and then actually the majority of wood production in Ghana is for domestic use and or, you know, is sold uh, to other countries in West Africa. So none of this is particularly visible to, to you know, the legality standard or the flag tea process as of yet. Um, there are also certain structural challenges that something like a legality standard does not address. 
you know, if you have um, state forestry departments that are severely underfunded, how is it, you know, addressing that particular uh, structural issue? And if you're taking the limited amount of money that's there and starting to put in new laws and institutions to meet international demands for legality licensing, what effect does that have on um, on the ability to, um, on, the, on the way that the state de uh, forestry department functions, you have issues around government corruption. And then very importantly, you have the issue of how the court system is functioning as it is. Does everyone have equal access to, to due process in law? If you're gonna start enforcing the law without that, then clearly that's gonna start to raise, you know, certain um, issues around equity and, and justice. So what you see is a channeling of resources and attention into generating licenses for export, computerized tracking systems and external surveillance and control. Now it gets even messier if you go down to the ground level, which was where we were at doing our research on um, cocoa forest landscapes around the Kakum area and start to see um, what a legal, a legal, not illegal, legal logging concession looks like. So this is a widow's cocoa farm um, that has been turned into a skid trail um, to, you know, basically um, because it was a shortcut for dragging the log, the logs to, um, you know, uh, to the, to the other road. So in, in the process, this widow lost something. She estimated at least 20 cocoa plants, um, cocoa plants and plantain uh, plants and tried every avenue she could for legal resource course or some kind of compensation and, and failed. Um, so this is essentially a now, you could argue it's not the way it's supposed to be, but that is what a legal concession has looked like. And it you know, may be continuing to look like. And now the other thing I want to point out is that this widow, meanwhile, to the extent that she has remaining cocoa uh, crops, is going to find it increasingly challenging now to sell those crops you know, into um, the especially European but international markets. Why? Well, because as a cocoa farmer in Ghana, the proliferation of requirements that are now, you know, evolving to verify to the international community that what the cocoa farmer is doing is sustainable is, is really um, becoming quite remarkable. So you have your various, you know, voluntary sustainability certification schemes. You have competing or different forest carbon market requirements. You now have the EU, the UK, the US, the France and Germany and various countries developing new uh, supply chain due diligence requirements that will require that this widow is able to show that her cocoa is not, um, for, you know, leading to deforestation and that she doesn't have any child labor, et cetera, et cetera. So if we look at these, these kinds of trends within international land use governance and the three dimensions of equity, it raises a number of, of interesting challenges. You know, as I mentioned earlier, the setting of target standards and metrics by international actors does by definition exclude to some extent, if not more so, the majority of those most affected by those, um, by those initiatives. In terms of recognition, um, we're prioritizing perhaps global legibility through standardization, quantification, the primacy of science over local knowledge, validated through external surveillance that exclude actors without legally recognized rights, which I'm sure has been talked about a fair amount today. They don't have legally recognized rights. If you don't have formal documents or means to pay for verification, where does this leave you? Another thing of very, very great relevance in terms of broad trends what does it mean for distributional equity if we start um, you know, developing quantified metrics for, for, for our values? Um, quantified metrics, not necessarily, but are easily monetized and therefore easily captured by dominant actors in global trade. So if we consider all of these um, dimensions, what would an equitable and transformative NBS require? So from a procedural equity point of view, I think it's probably generally agreed there needs to be more devolution of power and decision making and that unilateral policies and global market based approaches may often reinforce inequalities between global north and south between export and domestic markets between rich and poor that there's a real need for us to think more about national and local determination of both problems and solutions that prioritize domestic and local welfare and that take domestic and local markets seriously not as a problem but as something that that needs to be um, you know, uh, fostered and, and supported. So recognition of diverse uh, cultures and knowledge systems targets when they are in disembedded from the norms they purport to serve are readily appropriated by powerful actors. And 
people have talked about a tyranny of force. Okay, fine. But what about the tyranny of numbers? That vastly, if, if we would not require and, and see um, standards reporting and verifying as the answer um, to necessarily in all contexts, we could vastly open the space for solutions coming more from the ground up and from different contexts. And in terms of distributional equity, um, you know, there needs to be some redistribution of costs and benefits. So we need to urgently stop offloading the costs and burdens of sustainable initiatives onto those not at the table, least able to pay and least likely to benefit. This will require shower, uh, power sharing across scales. And in doing so, we will have to accept that a zero deforestation pledge may not be something that everyone's going to agree to too. So how are we gonna do, how are we gonna resolve that issue in some sort of uh, relatively equitable way? So I just wanna close by saying this also has implications for research, because I think there's a lot of emphasis now going into, you know, sort of um, uh, global scale models, um, you know, quantifying the challenges that we're facing and coming up with, you know, sort of standardizable solutions, but actually, if we really want to understand and and contribute to co-produced place-based solutions, then we need more co-produced place-based case studies to understand how multi-level governance is landing in local places. And we also, I think, really need, need to take more seriously what can we learn from local governance and livelihoods and their existing contributions to nature-based solutions. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Connie. We're going to hand straight over to um, Rachel. Um, and we'll yeah do make a note of your questions and questions for for afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Well, that was an amazing talk, <laughs> uh, and I'm and I'm glad to follow up on that because uh, there are going to be some similar themes. Uh, and today, I sort of wanted to dig into this idea that it's actually been mentioned several times that so long as we're just inclusive, oftentimes in the participatory design of the these NBS um, that that will ultimately lead to better outcomes, both on the conservation side and for people. So, I mean, is that actually true? And I'm coming at this from a land system science perspective. So really I see land at the center of, of these nature-based solutions. I think that's generally how people have been talking about them, but of course people are really at the center of these land systems. So uh, ultimately I think everybody's in agreement that if we don't, see all of this from the perspective of the individual agents on the ground, then um, we'll really, there's no hope that we'd be designing actual solutions. And just as an example of all of this, uh, there's been <laughs> exactly this, all of these high level mapping efforts in recent years to sort of define priorities for certain um, nature-based solutions. If we take restoration, there's been a proliferation of global maps. This is the one by Strasbourg et al. Um, I should have written that. Uh, sorry, this is embedded in this map that we created. Uh, and they made these uh, estimates of the areas with the highest restoration priority. And then just as an example, we overlaid population density. And in another map in this paper, we overlaid um, human development indicators. But just as an example, you can see all these areas in yellow are places marked as having high restoration priority and have among the highest population densities in the world. So what does it actually mean for these to be priority restoration areas? Obviously there's going to be some, some trade-offs and goal conflicts with the people who, who very much inhabit these spaces. So the question is, if we really take this seriously and if we really focus on equity and inclusion at the first instance, does that guarantee we're gonna get these better outcomes, um, more effective and more equitable? outcomes um, in terms of, of, of distributional effects and biodiversity and climate protection. And just to say, you know, while it's gaining a lot of traction right now, this question of the importance of equity has been around for a really long time. Um, Unai Pasquale did excellent work on this in um, payments for environmental services and, and, and elaborate on both a bunch of risks and opportunities that can come from taking social equity concerns very seriously in the design of specific policies. And of course, I've seen this come up in, I just took this from a presentation yesterday, um, that, that again, everybody's just saying equity, equity, equity. But I think, I guess here I wanna provide some cautionary tales about being a little bit more specific about what we mean about equity. Um, and Connie already started, so that's great. And, and so what I'm gonna argue is that there's at least, this is just, 
three, but there's at least three central dimensions that would, would need to be in place for this to actually be a solution for um, for both conservation and, and people. Um, so you don't need just the participatory design process, but you need implementation to be equitably delegated with democratic, flexible, and adaptable um, decision-making processes at local scales, but also in alignment with existing governance arrangements. So this implementation challenge is actually quite significant. Um, and for it to be equitable, to, for it to be truly equitable, it actually has to result in opportunities for benefits to the most marginalized actors. This can be in tension with the participatory design process, because if you have a participatory process, ultimately the most powerful actors are often the ones whose voices are really heard and get to end up um, um, leading the design process. So just to say that these conclusions, I'll take you through a few cases, but they also can be derived from some emerging facts that we can see in land system science. This is from a recent paper, 10 Facts About Land Systems for Sustainability, um, from the Global Land Program Science Steering Committee and, 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 and recent fellows. And just a summary of some of the important facts. Fact one, land is a source of and focus of multiple meanings and values. So there's a pluralism there that, that you can't ignore. Fact six, people already use or manage three quarters of the world's surface and, and even seemingly unused or areas for restoration opportunities <laughs> already are providing benefits to people in their current form. Uh, fact seven, land use entails trade-offs more often when win-wins. It's actually very hard to find win-wins and, and embedded in the conversations the last day has been an assumption that there's always co-benefits. That may not be the case. Um, and maximizing the benefit of one land, one, one talk already showed this. If you, if you prioritize climate mitigation, there are often trade-offs with biodiversity, just as an example. Um, and fact nine, the benefits and risks uh, from land use are unevenly distributed. And uh, control over those land resources is increasingly concentrated in the hands of a few actors. So all of these things give rise to these uh, particular uh, needs for all of the elements of, of equity that Connie already described and some of these central dimensions that I mentioned on the last page. So I'll take you through beef cattle, which I've been working on for over a decade, and just show um, an example. So there are these global zero deforestation commitments. Um, there's a G4 agreement in Brazilian Amazon, but as an alternative, they tried developing something a little bit more inclusive. Um, and, and it's called the, the Terms of Adjustment of Conduct. I'll get there in a second. But basically, to understand the effects of this, you have to first see that the typical supply chain in the Brazilian Amazon has many different um, cow-calf producers, smallholder producers, um, many, many, many of those. Um, even though a majority of the land is occupied by larger farmers, and they typically supply to these stockers and finishers, and then they're the ones who directly supply to slaughterhouses, both federally inspected state slaughterhouses, but a much uh, a, a, another range of informal um, meat packers and slaughterers that uh, maybe have less good terms of marketing. So this terms of adjustment of conduct was set up by the public prosecutor's office and was working with the slaughterhouses to define something a little bit more achievable. Um, and it asked them for continuous improvement towards zero illegal instead of zero gross deforestation. So this is how they were inclusive towards the slaughterhouses. But the issue was this wasn't um, designed in a way that was implemented in an inequitable manner. And, and then the slaughterhouses responded by just dropping some of their direct suppliers, the ones that had more smallholders in their system that were unable to verify their whole chain. And ultimately, um, um, what we found in our field work is that also those direct uh, suppliers had incentives to drop many of their smallholders as well. So what you end up seeing is this bifurcation of the market where uh, a subset of large wealthier farmers ended up verticalizing their whole operation system, producing the calves all the way to finishing. The smallholders got further pushed out of the whole system, are now in worsened conditions, have no incentive to do zero deforestation, and are selling through middlemen into local um, slaughterhouses. So uh, the point here, the takeaway, is that a participatory was process, a process was present at some level in this policy, but the implementation of this inclusive policy was, was delegated to powerful actors that then essentially just um, um, used it as an opportunity to, to push the more marginalized actors out of the system. Another cautionary tale, again, uh, you have a very well-meaning um, forest and landscape restoration effort in Malawi, 
And um, this was implemented in the context of this national forest landscape restoration strategy. And it has all sorts of types of, of um, restoration. So that's great. It's inclusive of many options, native forests, plantations, woodlots. Uh, it's built on decentralized, uh, existing decentralized community forestry management systems in the country. Um, and it has this quite ambitious attempt uh, to link between all of these governance actors, both horizontally and um, across sectors and across different scales. So all is good so far, but the problem is restoration projects don't found, follow governance boundaries, and there was not a good spatial fit between the projects themselves and these idealized governance arrangements. And so then ultimately the projects never received the financial or operational support and the social learning processes never got formalized to allow for this actual exchange across um, sectors and scales. Um, so again, another cautionary tale, the participatory process was present, but the governance system didn't foster sufficient cooperation. Um, it wasn't actually like democratic decision-making and, and adaptable decision-making process to take into account these, um, these misfit uh, situations between the projects and the governance. And then finally, the last one is an ecosystem-based adaptation case, um, which is by definition supposed to be taking communities at the center and improving their resilience and uh, adaptation to climate change. And these initiatives were specifically um, in Northern Europe uh, intending to, to promote and protect the Sami people, which is an, a marginalized indigenous um, group there. And they even went so far as to do all this nice mapping of their values and, and their current uses of the area and their preferences. But then when it came down to it, um, the planning decisions had to take into account green energy development, tourism, urban area expansion, cattle ranching, and as well as the Sami reindeer herding. And what happened was um, the indigenous local knowledge was provided into the system, but then ultimately not always respected, not always recognized. And then all these fundamental trade-offs prevailed between what Sami wanted and what other land users wanted. And then in the end, the planning decisions ended up being skewed towards the more powerful actors in the system, um, especially outside of the core Sami areas. So the takeaway here is even when the nature-based solutions aim to realize the benefits for livelihoods, co-benefits just might not be possible. There might be fundamental trade-offs um, between culturally important livelihoods and climate mitigation goals. So again, I just want to leave you with the takeaway that participatory processes are an important central dimension, but not sufficient. And uh, you need to be asking who participates and how, where did the benefits go, what discourses ended up dominating, how do people relate to land and how do their motivations differ, where might those trade-offs occur, um, and which ones are you going to actually prioritize. So it's just that fact 10 actually in this paper um, really resonates with Connie's final slide again that uh, governance processes that do not acknowledge distinct forms of justice will be considered unjust. And, um, and you must acknowledge multiple perceptions of beliefs and values, multiple visions of justice, and these power differentials. So I just want to finish by thanking uh, my group members whose, whose research that I highlighted, Federico Camelli and Sarah Lofquist um, from the Environmental Policy Lab, as well as my collaborators at the Global Land Program Science Steering Committee. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, we're now hoping to, to move on to our online, move online um, to Karel. Are you there? I would like to talk about the land use change and the sustainability of palm oil industry in Indonesia uh, in the term of how inclusive the community-based land and forest rehabilitation can strengthen this national-based uh, solution. So I'm very glad that uh, two speakers before uh, talking about the inequality. I think this is also uh, a problem that we have uh, here in Indonesia. Uh, I would like to begin with the historical background of the, uh, uh, of the deforestation and land use changing in Indonesia. Uh, maybe everybody remember that uh, during the 70s to up to the 90s, the forestation and land degradation mainly caused by the massive logging activities. At that time, we uh, do not have, we didn't, did not have a link, uh, what we call it, knowledge, and also know how. And then we asked, uh, uh, what we call it, the help from the expert from the uh, Pacific Northwest and also from the Philippines. 
yeah how to cut the tree yeah in the forest that was it back in 1970 and at that time what we, what we did is a kind of a clear cutting yeah we cut everything and nothing left behind now this area become a secondary forest yeah and then all of the uh, primary forests maybe now uh, in Java, for example, only, only left about 15%. Uh, and in Kalimantan or Borneo, maybe left only uh, about 30 or to 40% only. Uh, deforestation and uh, peatland degradation also occur due to the expansion of the ag agricultural areas, yeah, which have began uh, on large scale in 1970s. And it reached its peak in 1996. Maybe everybody know about this one million hectare peatland development project in central Kalimantan. The reason why we develop the uh, uh, agricultural area uh, in the peatland at the time, because uh, we learn from the indigenous people who live in the eastern part of Sumatra and also in the coastal area of Kalimantan, mostly Buginis, Banjaris, yeah. Uh, they utilize this pit uh, soil for uh, agricultural activities, mostly paddy, yeah, paddy field. Uh, but uh, they have their own, uh, what we call it, their uh, local knowledge, yeah, local wisdom uh, to manage this uh, small uh, uh, area. Yeah, they just uh, what we call it, uh, uh, open up. Yeah, the very uh, shallow uh, pit land area. They never come into the pit dome area to develop agricultural uh, uh, activities. And then between 1990 and 2015, everybody know that the large scale expansion of oil palm plantation occurred and it resulted in direct and indirect land use changes. So currently the total area of this uh, oil palm uh, is around 16 million hectares. In addition to this uh, uh, oil palm expansion, open pit mining, primarily coal mining, also contributed to deforestation and land degradation in the Kalimantan or Borneo Island. And then if we look at the uh, three pillars of the sustainability of palm oil, uh, from economic perspective, palm oil is an important and strategic community for the Indonesian economy. The largest, Indonesia is the largest palm oil producers, uh, about 47 million tons annually, and also it contributes 13% uh, of Indonesia's total export. From social uh, point of view, 41% of the oil palm plantation in Indonesia are smallholders, and then it uh, create 4.2 million uh, jobs directly and 12 million jobs indirectly. But uh, on the other hand, uh, the land tenure conflict between villages and the last plantation owners are quite high because uh, the last plantation become closer and closer to the village. And also the villages, most of the villages, they do not have the land title. Yeah, so legally, uh, this is a kind of also inequality, yeah. Uh, if you look at this uh, situation uh, in, in, in the village area. And the other thing is the, the villages or the smallholder plantation also a very weak bargaining power because the uh, nature of the monopolistic uh, market of this uh, palm oil uh, in Indonesia. And also from the environmental perspective, yeah, we know that some of the uh, oil palm plantation area coming from the conversion of high carbon stock forests and peatland. And also some of the illegal smallholder plantation even open up the conservation area and the national park like in Teso Nilo, yeah, in, 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 the, in the heart of Sumatra Island. Uh, almost 70% of this uh, national park being converted illegally into the oil palm plantation. This is a triggered international tensions. Uh, I remember uh, one of the famous actor Harrison Ford uh, came to Indonesia and visited several ministers. And then uh, he protested about this kind of situation 
uh, why the government uh, did not act uh, uh, what we call it uh, properly to to mitigate this uh, uh, deforestation and what uh, the ministry of environment and forestry uh, did since uh, 2016 uh, the ministry has been uh, what we, implementing massive land and forest rehabilitation program nationwide. Uh, this program conducted through the community uh, empowerment. So the community participated in breeding, planting, and maintenance of this uh, LFR implementation. Uh, by the year 2021, uh, this uh, program already maintain an area of about 6,000 hectares, and then with a target 15,000 hectares, basically. All seedlings are selected not only as a function of greening, but also have economic value. So the villages admitted that the uh, LFRA program really touched and empowered the community so that it brought economic benefits for them. And also they, they have changed their attitude so they are no longer uh, willing to uh, plant the oil farm in, in the area and try to manage and maintain uh, this uh, land and forest uh, uh, restoration uh, program intact. Uh, this way, the community will protect the forest and land area. But this is just the beginning, yeah? 21 and 22. We, we, we do not know uh, how this program uh, uh, will be effectively uh, for the uh, mitigation of the land degradation and deforestation uh, in the future. Uh, the other, uh, in the 2016, the government you know, of Indonesia established the Pitland and Mangrove Restoration uh, Agency, PMRA. Uh, P, the, the target is very huge, it's very daunting, about 2 million hectares within uh, uh, from uh, 2016 up to now, uh, with the five major tasks. First is pit restoration as an effort to restore degraded pit, ec degraded pit ecosystem so that hydrological conditions, structure, and function are recovered. Uh, the, 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 the activities in the field is actually rewetting the pit land that already being drained by the people and by the uh, corporation in the past. The second is revegetation is an effort to restore land cover in pit ecosystem through planting native plant species yeah, in the protected function or with the other type of land that are adapted to wetlands and have, and have economic value in the cultivation function. The third uh, program is the revitalization of community livelihood. Yeah. We know when the community is uh, still in, under, in poor condition, it is impossible to implement such a program. So uh, the mostly uh, likely the program will fail in the future because uh, they did not have, uh, what we call it, enough uh, livelihood in the area. So they come and enter the forest and cut the trees. The, the fourth uh, program is pit care pillage. So it's a kind of uh, alignment framework for existing development program in pit rural areas especially in and around pit restoration area. This approach is to build cooperation between villages in one landscape of the pit hydrological unit. And the fifth is the young generation who cares about pit villages prosperity. So it is involving the uh, young generation to uh, actively participate yeah, in the uh, village community to carry out activities that support pit restoration action. Uh, this is some of the results yeah, uh, up to now from this uh, PMRA, as you can see, uh, by the year of 2020, uh, 360,000 of pit land uh, being restored and 228,000 of mangrove area. Uh, PMRA also supervises the plantation companies with an area of restoration target around 500,000 hectares. Uh, <clears throat> the other effort conducted by the uh, 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 corporation, yeah, uh, like uh, uh, Unilever, yeah. Oh, no, oh, no, sorry. Uh, this one is, uh, let me see. Oh, this is the tax duty, yeah. 
the tax duty of the uh, export or the uh, CPO. Uh, the money that collected from this uh, tax uh, is used for replanting the small harvest oil palm. Uh, we know that the, the, the productivity of the small harvest oil palm only 50% compared to the last uh, plantation. So uh, the government has a program to replant uh, this oil palm plantation with the more sustainable and higher yield of oil palm so it could reduce the risk of illegal and land clearing in the future. Uh, the rest is about biofuel. Uh, I think the, 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 the third one is uh, uh, correlated with the uh, uh, natural best solution, research and development program. Uh, this program aims to provide solution to various problems, uh, ranging from the plantation up to the environmental uh, aspects. Okay, this is uh, indirect land use change. I think uh, I missed one of the my uh, what we call it the presentation here uh, about the uh, effort made by the corporation to help the smallholders uh, to comply with the sustainable uh, uh, oil palm uh, practices. Uh, the way they help these uh, smallholders by uh, what we call it the uh, buying the uh, RSPO, yeah, Roundtable uh, Sustainability uh, Palm Oil uh, Certificate. So for the smallholders already get, say, for example, one ton of the palm oil, uh, certified palm oil, the company will pay for around uh, $1.35. And this money is collected and managed by the community of the smallholder plantation to improve the capability yeah, uh, to grow the oil palm uh, sustainably. Yeah. And then we are, I'm going to talk about the indirect land use change. Uh, indirect land use change occur when land originally used to produce food crop is diverted to land to produce feed stock. Uh, we are fully understand uh, with this indirect land use change, but the problem is. Uh, we cannot observe yeah, uh, in, in the field. So uh, the scientists use the mathemat mathematical model yeah, to approach or to estimate the potential impacts. And the problem also since this uh, ILAC cannot be observed and measured consequently, the mathematical model used cannot also be verified and validated. Uh, there are four types of model. Yeah? And then as you can see here, palm oil, uh, result uh, what we could, uh, is considered to be a high uh, ILAC risk because produce the CA2, CO2 emission, the highest CO2 emission, and then, then followed by soy oil. There are four models, but the, there are huge differences in the emission calculation uh, from these four models. And this is uh, what we call it the data report from the uh, Commission to the European Parliament. Uh, about the feedstock, uh, maize, oil palm, rapeseed, and you can see here oil palm uh, share the highest deforestation in the additional planted area, almost 70%. So now come to the recommendation. So I think uh, the current undertaking on inclusive community empowerment should be uh, uh, continued and strengthened. The community-based land and forest rehabilitation program, uh, like a three-hour work by PRMA, should be strengthened. Farmer empowerment program should be extended to cover all smallholders plantation, and the fund collected from palm oil export duty should be used to support R&D and to improve productivity of smallholder plantation and to restore peatland and mangrove as well. If necessary, the government could also reenact the uh, policy of moratorium. So the governance of the moratorium on the conversion of forest and peatland for oil palm plantation need to be improved so that the moratorium policy can be properly implemented in the field. The success of this policy can protect existing carbon sink to help mitigate climate change, i.e. to reduce the release of uh, greenhouse gases from agriculture and forest land. Uh, there is also a need to establish cooperation among government, scientists, and researchers globally 
to explore the benefit, limitation, and effectiveness of natural-based solution concept, particularly in the Indonesian context as, as a tropical country. Uh, as far as the uh, ILAC is concerned, uh, I think I'd like to uh, endorse this uh, Gernot Klepper uh, recommendation. Uh, instead of continuing to discuss deforestation due to the ILAC, discussion should be directed at how the real causes of ILAC can be reduced or suppressed, for example, through climate and biodiversity friendly land use arrangement and through improving agricultural efficiency. Uh, uh, from the uh, practitioners yeah, uh, uh, in the field, I think uh, they propose uh, ILAC policy to be based on the certification system. So we, why don't we include this ILAC yeah, to be one of the criteria for the certification of the uh, palm oil uh, in Indonesia? And also they would like to include this into uh, goal 7 and 13 of SDGs. Uh, why did this stop? Okay, I think uh, I have some pictures basically, but uh, I cannot share it here. I would like also to uh, want to, to endorse, yeah, okay. Yeah, this one for the final one. Uh, as the two speakers before uh, talking about inequality, I think yeah the the, the situation uh, domestically we have also inequality of knowledge and know-how between the politician, between the people in the uh, uh, educational system, the economic system, the natural environment, and the media. This was proposed by Karayanis, and I like this model. So. In order to be able to solve this problem, inequality problem, uh, land degradation problem, how can we well, continuously create the knowledge and know-how, and how can we communicate this knowledge yeah, to the decision makers, to the economists, to the uh, university, to the society, etc. So this is be the key for for what we could uh, in order to be able to mitigate the uh, 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 greenhouse gases or uh, climate change in the future. Thank you. I should like to begin by thanking the organizers and also the conveners of this uh, amazing session um, for this opportunity to share with you some insights from um, the hotspots intervention area governance mechanism in Ghana. I'm talking about the need for equity in uh, uh, nature-based solutions. I think this provides a, 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 some kind of insights into how multi-level uh, governance framework uh, could help, but also uh, it points to some pitfalls that we possibly need to uh, guard against when, when we think of multi-level uh, governance mechanisms for nature-based solutions. So um, I would like to start by uh, giving a, a brief introduction about the context, uh, the context within which uh, this uh, is situated. So in Ghana, every year about 140,000 hectares of the high forest zone is lost to deforestation. And whilst logging and illegal mining play a very important uh, role in, in, in this deforestation, the state estimates that about 83% of, of, of deforestation in the region is caused by agricultural expansion. And it goes better to tell us that uh, chocolates, which uh, most of us, I'm sure, we really love, cocoa, which is a, a core ingredient for producing that plays a big part in driving this deforestation. So typically what you see in the landscape is you might, you might on, the edge of a, uh, on the edge of a forest, see what appears to be a forest, but then when you go in, uh, you know, this is another side of the story. And typically what happens is that to the untrained eye, this might look like a, a banana or a plantain plantation within the forest. But then when you look a bit deeper, you see that it's, it's a kind of a, a, a precursor to establishing cocoa, where the, the plantains and the bananas provide a kind of shade for cocoa to take roots. And so, what Ghana really did was that um, over, the, over the last few years, it has uh, decided to implement this uh, Cocoa Red Plus, uh, Cocoa Forest Red Plus program, which is a, a kind of a, a partnership between private sector, uh, between the government and also civil society to sort of tackle deforestation within this high forest zone. 
And in doing this, the government has really adopted a, a kind of a nested approach, which I would like to take you through briefly before uh, pointing to some critiques. So if you, if you look at the, the, the broader landscape that, that is looked at, what the government has done is essentially divide these areas into what it calls hotspot intervention areas. And this, these are quite huge areas. They range from around 240,000 hectares to 380,000 hectares. And within each, lands, within each of these HIAs, the government goes further to break, to uh, sort of impose this multi-level uh, governance mechanism where at, at the very basic level, each community has what it calls a community resource management committee. And so this, from this community level, a number of communities come together to form what we call a community resource management area. The idea behind this essentially is that it wants to sort of devolve management rights over this space to local communities so that they can actually be able to manage the resources there next to their farms. And then as part of this uh, hotspot intervention area uh, governance mechanism, a number of CREMES come together to form what we call a sub-HIA, which is also like another level. And then from the sub-HIA, uh, there's also another higher level, which is the greater uh, hotspot intervention area or the bigger, uh, the bigger landscape. And so to show you really how this works, it's like a three-tier multi-level governance mechanism, starting from the very base where you have the tier one, the community, the CREMA level, and then from there, you have the second, which is the sub-HIA level. And then the, the third part is where you have the HIA itself. And there, what, what is done is that right down from the base here, executives are nominated or elected from the communities, and then they form what is called the Hotspot Intervention Area Management Board. The essence of this board is to engage in partnership with the private sector cocoa, uh, cocoa buying companies and also with the government and, and for, uh, forestry officials um, the, the government agency in, char in charge of cocoa uh, and civil society to form a broad-based partnership. And this part, through this partnership, they sign a kind of a framework agreement that tells how they will manage the individual smaller land, uh, landscapes within the broader HIA. And so what they intend to do really is to, through this, be able to at least deliver about 1.8 million hectares uh, cocoa agroforestry systems, whilst also contributing to protecting about 1.3 million hectares uh, of forest uh, reserves. And so what we sought to do, this initiative is quite young, it's actually about, three, it's in the third year now, but what we sought to do is to really just try to look at how this initiative is evolving, and also really to look at what kind of powers have been devolved to these local communities uh, in, in terms of how they are able to decide uh, on their affairs. And to do this, we sort of uh, engage a decentralized governance framework where we look at four main domains of power that can be uh, you know, devolved, devolved to communities. Um, the first level happens to do with decision making. What kind of powers do these you know, smaller uh, level uh, community-based uh, structures or institutions have in terms of making decisions and also in terms of making rules for the governing the, the landscape of, over which they have control. And then also in terms of enforcing compliance to some of the rules that they, they are able to formulate, as well as managing conflicts that may emerge within this space that, as it were, uh, is expected to be devolved to them. And so to do this, we, we, we looked at the first HIA uh, governance mechanism that was created in, in the Western parts of Ghana. It's called the Grabosubia Hotspot Intervention Area. And within that area, there are about 10 CREMES and also some non crema communities but these have converged into six sub-HIAs, like I had shown in the structure earlier. A lot of acronyms, I'm, I'm aware, but please bear with me. <laughs> and, and then also there's the higher HMB, uh, which is the management board. But within this landscape, you have this myriad of actors. Uh, Two-Tone here is a cocoa buying company that is very active in, in that landscape. It's not the only cocoa buying company there, but somehow it seems to be the one most active in, in, in this initiative. You have the Ghana Cocoa Board, which has a kind of a monopoly over the, the cocoa sector in Ghana. The Forestry Commission, which is in charge of uh, managing forest resources. And you have a bunch of civil society organizations that, as it were, also seek to facilitate uh, this whole process. And so we, we engage the, the, the farmers right down from the grassroots, the village level structures to, to understand really how they, they feel about all this. And also, you know, we visited some of their farms and also some of the forests to, to really, you know, see firsthand 
how things are going there. Um, the main things we found out so far is that first, and the whole, you know, decentralization seemed to have occurred really rather nicely. Like it started off with a lot of enthusiasm just about two, uh, three years ago. But as, as we speak now, it seems to have taken a, a tumble. Nobody, nobody really knows uh, what, what is going on there now. And so this CREMES, which is like the, the, when a, a couple of communities come together to form this, uh, you know, uh, resource management areas, instead of it becoming an avenue for communities to really build consensus and really tackle issues that are of concern to them, it seems to have become a more of a mechanism for policing forest resources. And then also what we found out was that this multi-level governance uh, mechanism seems to have imposed a lot of responsibilities on local communities without actually providing incentives or uh, also uh, tending to their needs. To even dive a bit uh, further in, when it comes to uh, the kind of powers that this uh, mechanism grants to communities in terms of making decisions, uh, we found out that politically at the district level, there, there, there is a, a, a CREMA bylaw. And this bylaw provides that communities should be able to grant their consent whenever forestry authorities want to, for example, harvest resources within this area that has been devolved to them. But we find that at the village level, the constitution does not even mention this. So it, it also becomes an issue of communities don't know that they, they have this power to be able to, for example, kick out anybody who comes to say, I have a permit to cut down trees from your crema. And then the other thing also we found was that at a higher level, um, although the HMB has the power to be able to decide on the kind of investment and the kind of actors it invites to invest in that landscape, um, there's currently no plan in place to, to, to be able to uh, sort of attract investment. Uh, technically, the private sector was supposed to provide funding for developing this multi-level uh, landscape management plan, but somehow uh, it seemed to be shaking that uh, responsibility. Um, a very interesting case happened during one of the interviews where despite this HMB uh, you know, evolving to become a sort of a main decision-making body over the landscape, the World Bank had gone further to develop some sort of guidelines for how it, uh, you know, uh, in, in terms of Red Plus payments, because this is, this is linked to the Red Plus program, how such money should be used. And then there, there, there was a case where three of the members of the board said, well, we are not accepting these guidelines because it's our landscape. We have no idea how you came up with these guidelines. We're not consulted. So how are we so expected to implement this, this guidelines? So those are some of perhaps the, the positives that, that, that seem to have uh, come out in, in that respect, in, in sort of giving this uh, you know, local leaders a kind of a voice. The other thing we found when, uh, when it comes to compliance was that th this seemed to be a kind of the most popular thing within the communities. Most of the CREMA members and the sub-HIE and the HIE members we interviewed, they see this more like you know, a kind of a, a front for enforcing forest uh, rules instead of building consensus. So very often, although they don't really have much resources, they try to police forest resources, leading to a lot of conflicts here and there. In terms of managing conflicts, what we found was that the, the, the laws really restrict uh, you know, these local management structures in terms, of, in terms of what they could adjudicate over. And often it is about managing their own affairs, but not really issues that has to conflicts that has to do with the, the broader landscape. So, for example, if an illegal operator comes, you know, to to log, they are not, that is a sort of beyond their their jurisdiction. And in terms of adjudicating conflicts, also we found that uh, these policies and laws seem to have given a lot of a lot more power to traditional authorities. But then. In a lot of the cases, we, we also saw that these traditional authorities were also parties to the conflict, and they are supposed to be helping resolve the conflicts that essentially they are creating. So it, it kind of takes some of the power from, from communities. The other things we like to, I would like to uh, highlight briefly relates to how this whole CREMA concept you know, also introduces a kind of contradiction within the landscape in that um, in Ghana, the Forestry Services Division, uh, you know, holds a lot of jurisdiction, especially when it comes to naturally occurring trees, because um, although you may own a land in Ghana, our constitution vests the rights to any naturally regenerated tree into the precedent. And so it's the commission that, you know, takes charge of, uh, you know, managing this rights as it's were. But then traditionally, what premiers are supposed to do is to devolve the, the, the entire management, you know, of the area to communities. So 
you have this contradiction. Is it the forestry commission that is supposed to, you know, manage the trees within there or do the communities labor and then the commission come to harvest the fruits of, of their labor? That contradiction is something that we observe. But more generally, we, we found that the creamers generally are very weak. It's just a handful of people. When you go to the village level and you want to speak to people, oh, oh the creamer people. So a, a few people have become known as the creamer people. So in the books, it looks like everything is going on well, but really, you know, on the, at the grassroots level, it's, it's a fine mess, I have to say. And so there's also this perception that initially creamers came, you know, it's evolved mainly from the wildlife uh, division. It came as a concept to really help communities build livelihoods. But now communities are getting more concerned that these creamers that were supposed to help build their livelihoods have become now more of like a lot of talk about ecosystem services, ecosystem services, instead of what farmers really uh, want them to tackle. So from this case, uh, I'd like to uh, draw three main, draw attention to three main points. And the first one is that the HIA uh, multi-level governance mechanism, uh, it seems to have sort of uh, become a structure, a kind of a symbolic represent, uh, participation, you know. It sort of portrays this vision as, you know, it's able to, you know, give uh, farmers and local communities more rights, but essentially it doesn't because there are several limitations in terms of the kind of rights these communities have. The other thing also is that because of this, there's a high risk that the kind of nature-based solutions that um, you know, the program seeks to implement, talking about the 1.5, uh, 1.8 hectares of agroforestry and then also the protection, there's a really high risk that this might not succeed because there, there are kind of contradictions. And the third point I would really like to point out also is the fact that when, when it comes to, you know, implementing this multi-level governance mechanisms, perhaps rather than the approach that Ghana took in this landscape where, you know, everything was imposed all of a sudden, perhaps it's good to start small, maybe start with one or two communities, learn from the, the multiple contradictions that are likely to erupt, solve them where there need to be legislative reforms, make those reforms, and then gradually scale up so that you're able to, uh, to, to achieve something better. But more importantly, it's, 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 it's really critical to listen to the needs of, of communities. And from our work, these needs really include issues like farmers losing a lot of their cocoa to the black pot disease. And these issues are really not discussed within this crema, which you know, is, is a kind of a, uh, provides a kind of platform to farmers. It also has to do with issues around even water security during certain times of the year. It has to do with food security, because a lot of communities are not able to even produce food. They have to venture into forest, res uh, forest reserves, produce, foods, uh, uh, produce food, a lot of conflict with soldiers, cutting down their farms and all of that. But these issues are not looked at within the broader landscape. And, so, and then also is the emerging issue of mining, where a lot of farmers are losing their cocoa farms with their main source of livelihood to, to mining. So essentially what this points out is that it really matters, you know, who takes the lead in, in sort of defining this multi-level governance mechanisms. And it really matters the kind of powers that are really devolved to communities. Otherwise, they become more like a, a kind of a sham that really invites participation, but really does not deliver much for communities. Thank you very much. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Mark. And uh, while I'm speaking, I'll also get the speakers to come back up on stage because we'll try and have a bit of a discussion, uh, an interactive discussion. Um, so thank you very much for, uh, for very interesting and inspiring presentations. Um, you've suddenly inspired me to write six pages of very confusing notes, um, which I'm going to try and navigate right now. Um, so, uh, yeah, we've had, uh, I think the panelists provided us with some really interesting case study examples um, and provided an opportunity to work through uh, different governance processes and think about how, when we're applying nature-based solutions in place, uh, what actually might happen um, and how do we navigate the challenges and the opportunities that arise. Um, they discussed the centrality of land and the idea of place uh, which can at times be uh, obscured by global mapping and standardization of environmental policies. Um, they talked about the need to be more specific about what we mean when we say equity. Um, and I think that came out throughout all of the presentations. Um, I think another point was this idea of pluralism um, and that there is there are always multiple values, multiple meanings uh, and multiple 
multiple priorities that are playing out um, and that there's not necessarily always a win-win or co-benefits um, and solutions for some people might be problems for others. Um, they talked about how nature-based solutions perhaps uh, might not necessarily deal with the drivers of degradation um, when, for instance, uh, there are plantations um, sorry, palm oil, plant, palm oil plantations, for example, might have perceived benefits and important benefits on jobs and economic growth in one instance, um, or there might be informal or illegal activities that are taking place that are kind of excluded from the view of a, of a solution perspective. Um, and also that uh, when we look at governance mechanisms, that, that, that there's always multiple levels that we should be paying attention to uh, and lots of different roles that governance actors can and should be playing uh, from decision making to mediating conflict um, and things like that. And we need to be careful about uh, how we distribute these powers um, and that sometimes uh, what appears to be inclusive governance actually puts limitations on uh, the types of rights that are, are devolved to different communities. Um, and therefore, we need to listen to people not only about their, their kind of needs and priorities, but how, how they're being involved in these processes um, that we think about. Um, and generally, that there's, I guess, the presentations informed us that there's no one size fits all approach to governance, um, that we, we might have committees, we might have decentralization, we might have cert certification. Uh, or legislation, uh, but we need to be paying attention to who who's leading and who's deciding about these processes um, in their development. And also, I think constantly reflect, being reflective um, about how they're going uh, and thinking about how we can change them in the process. Um, so I've identified a kind of set of themes uh, that I thought might be interesting to talk a bit more about. Um, one is the kind of who of governance. Uh, so this is about, yeah, who, who's taking part. When we talk about governance, who do we actually mean? Who, who are the actors of governance? Um, but also what are the spaces in which governance can take place? Um, and I wanted to uh, kind of challenge the panelists to think, to, to talk about uh, whether or not governance is something that only takes place in local places, or if there are other, you know, do, is, is, yeah, where is governance decided and where does it take place? Um, and how do we kind of navigate priorities around governance? Um, so I might jump into a first question, uh, which is, um, uh, yeah, so where does the focus of, trans if we're trying to transform, uh, create transformative change, where does governance need to take place uh, in your experience? Perfect. I'll, um, anyone, any of the panelists have any of the panelists are free to grab the microphone and have a first stab and then um yeah we'll open it up thanks jasper yeah sure thanks jasper um great reflections i think yeah where does governance need to be take place well of course it partly depends on what you're trying to govern so i think there is something to that sort of idea of subsidiarity, I guess you could say, that that if we're looking at global problems, we can't, you know, we are, they are global collective action problems to some extent, which is the great challenge, right? Because what makes a system seem legible and, and workable from a global perspective is not, we've seen very clearly, the same as what's necessarily going to make it legible and workable at a local scale. And so the real challenge is how do you, with these larger scale problems like climate change, or concern about overall loss of forests um, globally, you know, how do you coordinate across scale? I mean, I think that said, maybe um, there this idea of subsidiarity that you try to govern the process from as low a level as, as can be um, is going to make it more likely to be a governance process that's appropriate to context. And I also think that there is an element of um, you can even call it a sort of trust fall that needs to happen. I don't know if any, any of you used to play that exercise when you're a kid where you're expected to just fall backwards and hope that your friends will catch you. Um, and that doesn't always play out very well. But, but I think from a global level, this idea that we'll, we're going to have to control and monitor and survey everything or it's not going to go the right way is maybe not the right way to look at this challenge. And I think 
for example, there are lots of places in the world where people are managing indigenous people and other people as well that are managing land in a way that's really not so bad. So how can we at least not get in their way or how can we support what they're doing? And that's what I think I was trying to say with the, let's take more seriously domestic and local markets and domestic and local solutions and try to see how we can work together rather than think that we need to come up with the solution, you know, sort of at, at a global scale. Yeah. Super. Um, Rachel, do you want to jump in? Did you have something? No, no. Okay. Um, yeah, so you started with a really hard question. Um, and, and I don't think there's a clear answer, but I would just add that uh, I guess I'm a little pragmatic about it because I do think there is an opportunity from these new global governance initiatives. I think in the end, um, there are massive structural problems that have led to the challenges that are happening in individual localities and so if we are if we're not paying attention to the opportunity to use market creation at the global scale um creating an even le a level playing field through regulations in import countries channeling finance from international organizations to local regions then um then that would also be problematic uh because in the end, um, there are some massive uh, problems with the way that our global global economies and institutions are structured. So, so I think it has to be all of them. Um, but I think a promising model, and I guess the jury is out. But I think a promising model is the way that you link um, import region policies to state level governance initiatives. And of course, the state level governance initiatives, like when I mean when I say state, I mean actual state, province, that type of level. Um, when those are built on um, democratic uh, and participatory processes, but then organized at the state or province level, as is happening um, in many regions right now in Indonesia, in Brazil, et cetera, um, then it's kind of a manageable scale with which the international community can engage and then the states can be a coordinating body for those more localized governance processes. But of course, that depends on the, the political um, conditions in those states. <laughs> I just think it, it might, I, I, I'm so, if, if I'm optimistic about something, it's that particular development and, and I'm, I'm, I'm eager to study it myself. Great, thank you very much. Um... Any questions um, from the floor? If not, we can. Um, I'll hand it. Oh, there is you, one. You, he wants to answer. Oh, Carol, hello. sorry. Hello? Yeah, can I add more about this uh, governance issues? From Cairo. Yes. Go ahead. Yes, but Cairo, please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I think. Uh, I would like to talk about this governance uh, by introdu introducing technology. Yeah. Uh, as Brett King uh, uh, wrote in his book uh, entitled Techno Socialism, so far when we are talking about technology, we just remember Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, yeah, uh, all of the tech giants in, in the world. But we hardly uh, think or use technology to solve the social problem, natural problem, environmental problem, etc. I think if we would like to improve the governance in the future, I think we should use the AI algorithm and uh, robotics. Yeah. So do not let this governance uh, calculate the uh, hand up by the bureaucrat uh, only in the government but we should uh, delegate that into the system into the, uh, what we call the command by the technology ai uh, robotics and algorithm uh, by uh, doing this i think we can improve the uh, equality yeah for the people uh, uh, in the village because if we wait until the people get educated it takes a very long time yeah maybe 10 or 20 years yeah we cannot uh, 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 reach this, uh, what we call it, a uh, uh, suitable situation. So, because a lot of asymmetric things happen in the world, economic, in the economic sector, uh, also in the social sector, also in education sector, also at the power of political uh, level. So, this is, I think, uh, uh, what we would like to put forward in, uh, uh, for, for, for this. Uh, what we, uh, so we can handle this governance in the future by using technology. Thank you. 
Thank you. I mean, I think there's uh, would be a range of views about the role of um, AI in governance and the governance of AI and technology itself. Um, we might want to follow up, pick up on that thread. Um, we have a question here in the back. We, we're vaguely going to try and um, uh, switch between uh, in person and online. So just so you're aware. But yes, Hi, please Paulina. go ahead. Thank you. Um, I actually, I took lectures with Connie like 12 years ago <laughs> at VCM. Um, so I work with a high conservation value network. So we work a lot with certification, um, medium sized companies and large companies trying to get them to um, produce more sustainably. But I guess one of our biggest challenges is smallholders. So catching them at the point before they convert land into a small plantation. Um, and now with the no deforestation regulations coming in the U EU and UK as well, um, we're kind of trying to figure out the incentives to get them not to convert. So in your experience, what are good incentives for smallholders? Because our, our mission is to try to get them into sustainable supply chains, but you know, they're at that point where, you know, should they convert for subsistence or weight? <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, no, I mean, that's one of the central questions of my research right now, because I've been working on these company supply chain policies for like eight years or so, and um, they 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 face some inherent limits. So if you're governing through supply chains and you're governing people who are already in the supply chain, you can't uh, you can't deal with new frontiers, and you can't deal with people who are not in your chain. Um, and there's always somebody who's who's not in the supply chain of of the actors who have made the commitments, um, and definitely people who are not in the actors in the supply chains of actors who actually implement their commitments, which is a smaller subset. So, um, so, and I actually don't think that we have the scientific evidence right now to say which type of approach works best. Um, but I will say that we have a paper led by Yanina Grabs where we lay out potential um, ways to manage this um, smallholder inclusion challenge. But I think it is really important that we, like when we're designing the policies, one thing that I think is that I can say now concretely is that when we're designing the policies, we don't create the opportunity for companies to pit the smallholder inclusion against the zero deforestation commitment and then use that as a cop out for actually implementing their policy, but rather the ways that NGOs are pressuring companies to adopt specific standards has to inherently already incorporate the smallholder aspect and make it so that it's not a strict market exclusion approach and is instead more of a capacity building approach towards a uh, you know, a, a continuous improvement model that has some teeth um, and, and, and capacity building, not just within your supply chain, but in the broader area of potential suppliers. Um, I'll stop there, but I'm happy to talk to you more about that. Okay. I'll add to that. I mean, I think, you know, I, I come from the question, I come at the question from a little bit of a different angle because I'm not starting necessarily with the bottom line is zero deforestation how can we include smallholders, especially when that bottom line is created by in a unilateral type of policy? I think that I'm just have, I'm struggling with seeing how that is being sort of in line with the ideas of, of equity and inclusion. But I think if we really want to think, for example, in Indonesia about bringing in smallholders, where there are certain things that could certainly happen, like the strengthening of community rights. Um, we've seen, I mean, I've had, um, you know, DFL students in some extent spilling into my research and, and it's well, you know, well documented um, many cases of communities not able to stop palm oil companies from coming into their to their area because they don't have the, the sort of it's the fundamental underlying structural problems that are creating this kind of dynamic. So it's so ironic, you know, when uh, many communities would like to keep out um, palm oil companies, for example, just like many Ghanaian cocoa farmers would like to not have the trees that they've been growing on their cocoa farm cut, but they don't have the power to stop it. So what do we do? The solution is to say that they're the problem and therefore we're gonna make it even harder for them to enter into these so-called so sustainable markets. I think the point is, you know, basically fundamentally there are structural inequalities that need to be addressed and that could be addressed. These are not, you know, things that, that, that are not unaddressable um, but you have to look at it from a whole so holistic way. And that's also one of the reasons we're so concerned about this fixation on, on quantitative targets. Unless you can feed 
into you know the 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 sort of metrics and unless you can verify that your traditional livelihood is contributing to global sustainability you're you're invisible in the process whereas a large palm oil company will have a much easier time you know accessing these markets so i think we have to think about this really holistically yet at the same time be pragmatic and it's true you know we're we're live in the political world that we do. So we have to try to find our way forward. But I do think it's also a critical role of researchers to point out, you know, that that we're not going to get there if we don't sort of under, under address these underlying inequalities and problems that we're facing um, as a global community. Thank you. Um, to add a bit to that, you know, um, historically, and I, I would use more of a, an example from Coco to elaborate, um, historically, deforestation and cocoa production have been inextricably linked. Uh, it's, it's, it's an issue that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's really going to take more than, you know, just zero deforestation commitment to tackle. Um, it's also an issue about inequalities, really, um, because cocoa farmers, I know several cocoa farmers who have been cocoa farmers and their grandparents were cocoa farmers and possibly their children will be cocoa farmers because the, the trade in cocoa is, is you know, it's, it's so unequal that you know the distribution of profits does not really make um, a lot of difference or it doesn't really make an economic sense for farmers to invest in improving their production systems so i think we 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 need to you know broaden the debates to you know include this multiple dimensions um for example you know ghana and ivory coast produce about you know 65% or more of cocoa and yet each year, you know, they, they receive less than 7% of the value, you know, from, from the, the, the value chain. So, you know, with this kind of investment, how do you, you know, invest in, in sustainable inputs? You know, a lot of farmers were practicing, you know, sustainable cocoa production. They had trees in their farms. And yet, you know, the quest for more production led to policy change where, okay, you know, cut down the trees, plant more sun cocoa so that you're able to get more yield. Forgetting that, you know, you're able to get more yields in, in a, a relatively short time and then, you know, you lose the productivity. So I think th this broader issues and, you know, the fixation on, you know, producing more and also uh, really issues around inequality in, in the trade need to be linked with, you know, the zero deforestation uh, discussion. I think that's, that's how we can really um, make a difference and not necessarily just setting the targets and, you know, putting a lot of responsibility on poor farmers who, you know, uh, very often, I, I tend to say, very often, if you look at the kind of water a lot of these farmers drink, uh, excuse me to say, the water that we use to flush our toilets are way, way better, you know. And so I think we really need to 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 be more human also and, and just, you know, not be fixated on, on the numbers. And, and, and I think we can make a lot of difference if we look at things from that perspective. I'm going to hand over to Mary to, to relay a question from the online um, participants. Yes, um, I have actually uh, quite a number of questions for each of the panelists. Mark, do you want me to just read one question now? Uh, or? You pick one that kind of speaks to a number of issues or is okay. it like repeated a number of times, that would be great. Yes. Um, so from um, from Hayati Hasibuan, the University of Indonesia, actually a question about what is going on on the ground when it comes to youth engagement. Uh, I mean, particularly because, uh, you know, uh, her, she asked actually directly to Eric uh, that, you know, that the scaling and enlarging will take time. But actually her interest now with this question is really what is happening on the ground when it comes to youth engagement in the grassroots. And then another one, just, just quickly, maybe this can be answered by all panelists, is from Al Hassan Ibrahim. He would like to know the views of the panelists regarding the specific stage of governance where communities should be key or should community involvement occur throughout the whole processes, or should the issues of time and resource limitation be managed? Who should be involved and at what stage? Thank you. Thank you very much. Eric, would you like to take the first yeah, question? Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start and then, yeah, um, on the issue uh, of youth, in the, in the case where I looked at, you know, it, it's, it was one of the core themes, you know, in, in terms of organizing the hotspot intervention area governance mechanism. 
Um, the plan essentially was, you know, bring on board a broad base of actors, including, you know, um, you know, women, youth groups, among others. So there was even this really interesting case that, you know, got communities all spooked up and then all of a sudden it was dropped. You know, initially there were even soccer tournaments, you know, football as a way of bringing people together, especially young people. So they are all engaged in the landscape governance, uh, 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 in the governance of the landscape. But then after one major tournament, you know, everybody was, you know, looking forward to the next one. I don't know if the next one will be played next year or something, you know, but it all got dropped. And so more and more, you know, the, the youth uh, are also not uh, engaged. Um, another thing I can also say about uh, youth really is that um, there's this notion that young people are not interested in farming. You know, it's, it's a very, it can, be, it can be debated from many perspectives. And within the cocoa landscape, a lot of young people still go into cocoa. It, it's, it's also more of an issue of land is a limitation. If you want to go into cocoa production, but then there is no land. And if you go and cultivate cocoa in a forest reserve, after four years of labor and maybe forestry authorities discover your farm and, and, and they cut it off. So youth are engaged in, 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 in many uh, other ways, but they also have their, their challenges. And perhaps we, all, we need you know, different approaches to, to bring them uh, more on board when we talk about governance of these initiatives. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll pause there and let the other panelists. Yeah. Great, thanks. So the question around when should you involve communities, if I understood that correctly? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's very hard to, to speak generally again um, in that it really, I guess it depends on the scale of at what scale we're talking about, which is a big challenge, of course, because again, as we're talking about scale, it is a challenge if you're if you're a global actor trying to address a challenge like climate change, you know, and feel that there's not time to consult every community around the world. You know, obviously that's that's not feasible. On the other hand, I would say, you know, it depends on who is most directly impacted by whatever the intervention might be. And then those, you know, that principle of who is most directly impacted having a say is something to keep in mind about when to involve communities. And I think, I think it has generally um, become somewhat of a norm in terms of community engagement that if you do engage communities in a project, et cetera, it needs to be done from the start and helping set the agenda, not just implement what has already been decided. And that if you do that, the hope is that um, both there, there will, it will be more effective and also be much more likely to be suitable to the context and, and benefit local communities. So that's a very general response, but yeah. I mean, I'm just give two specific examples of how this wasn't done properly. And I'm not saying I can show you the best example of how to do it properly, but um, in, in supply chain policies, they are very often, companies are very often delivering uh, technical assistance um, and, and creating policies, but there's no mechanism to convey knowledge back up through the chain. So we as researchers then have to do this work because that's not what they're set up to do. So we as researchers then have to be involved in, 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 in con constructing those focus groups and doing those interviews and in trying to highlight values and not just measure in, uh, impacts. You know, We need to change the way we're doing the research to make sure that there is some vessel um, for, for uh, enabling knowledge and participation in systems where there is actually no governance system or arrangement to facilitate that. Um, and then just for example, the EU due diligence regulations, uh, whatever process they had in place to come up with their current EU framework to halt import driven deforestation definitely does not reflect any of the views of even the national level governments in the producing regions. And I've had so many conversations with those people, let alone farming groups to say, what, how is this the way that this ended up getting written? And so at some point in the deliberations, you know, in the EU parliament, when they were arguing about this, they didn't have representatives from the producing regions or, or community representatives. And so, so clearly some space has to be made, you know, by us highlighting it, but also directly by the policymakers to make sure that in, in, you know, in the UK, in, in the EU, in the US, when these are being deliberated, they actually have those representatives there, but that's not enough. Right. So I, my whole talk was about how you can have people at that stage and that doesn't mean anything. So then you have to make sure that the uh, um, governance process includes an ad adaptive strategy that then revisits those communities that then has a deliberative process that then like reincorporates. Okay, this is actually not going well. We need to adjust this. Um, so yeah, that's all. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much. I saw a number of hands going up in the... Um, Mark, I think there is an issue of uh, the question, a part of the question is the limitation of the time and resource. How can, you know, the agency who deliver this uh, community-based engagement can resolve the issue of limitation of time and resource? Perhaps just quickly, if if Kairil could just contribute to perhaps your experience in conducting, you know, uh, community-based engagement in countries where you know, like Indonesia, where uh, islands, like many hundreds of islands need to be covered, for example. Yeah. Uh, I have made a paid a visit to several places, yeah. Uh, if we are talking about a community participation, uh, the, what we can do, the variation is very huge, yeah. Some of community, they have a very uh, uh, strong social cohesion. Uh, they can help uh, work together, yeah. For example, in the uh, 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 Borneo air, uh, I, island, uh, there is a transmigration community uh, help this uh, PMRA uh, uh, agency, yeah, to uh, maintain, to monitor all of the facilities in, installed in the field uh, for peat land uh, restoration activities. But the other village, villagers, yeah, not far away from the community that I visited, they don't care about this, all of the facilities. And finally, all of the drill uh, holes, uh, uh, what we call it, uh, a canal blocking, et cetera, is not working properly. So this, this is kind of a very uh, used variation. Yeah. It depends on the uh, uh, so what we call social cohesion of the society, of the community uh, in the area. Uh, the other thing is, uh, we also have some get some help from NGOs. As long as NGOs engage in the community, the, the program uh, are running smoothly. But uh, once the NGO left the community and everything is gone. So this is a kind of things, you know, uh, I don't know how to, to handle this kind of thing. It is probably uh, we could uh, we should address the uh, institutional aspect of this, yeah from the community point of view. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I see you just want to jump in. Yeah. I think one one uh, one possible way of, you know, overcoming that is, you know, um, to, to build stronger pharma groups because uh, invariably, you know, NGOs, or their, their operations are very much linked to, to funding. And so they are always, you know, in and out, you know, they are in there when there's money and out when they go, but farmers will always be there. And so if we, we you know, really invest, you know, in, in, in helping farmers build stronger associations on their own terms and not, not associations that we co op to serve our interests, you know, or the interests of specific actor groups, but really strong farmer groups that can be able to speak up for themselves. I think that really, really makes a, a big difference. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Eric and Cheryl. Um, Carlos. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, Carlos from the Laudato Si Research Institute here in Oxford. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask um, to all the speakers, really, um, whether is there a convergence in terms of what the research is telling us is, is, is actually that the methodologies on power on at all scales, uh, we're not taking them into account properly in the nature-based solutions. Is, is, is that, uh, in a nutshell, um, what we're getting at? Um, because what we're looking at is that the structural inequalities at different levels, they're not, uh, they're not really embedded, and, we, and nature-based solutions is actually blind to power. Is that, is that the conclusion that you would probably see? And, um, and, and because this is academic research, you, you, you're very welcome to be free and flow. And, <laughs> and I know that uh, this, this would be, for instance, IUCN is working on standard, standardization. So is it fair to say, I am just a participant, so I can, I can say it. Um, <laughs> is it fair to say that actually standardization is a form of power relation that is actually distorting a lot of the power relations at scales? Yeah. Thank you. Excellent question. Um, I'm sure, sure we will have plenty to say. Um, Connie, we'd love to go first and then. Sure. Um, yeah, thank you, Carlos. I mean, I think, well, 
yes, in terms of the general problems of, of power operations at all scales and also the challenges of how the logic of standardization works um, in terms of who is likely to have input into standard making processes, the, the, the formalistic systems that rely on someone having a legal identity, et cetera, all of those are, are major challenges. It, you know, it, it's so even whatever the intent of the initiative is, the tools that we use or the mechanisms that we use to implement it sometimes are the biggest part of the problem, perhaps. But I don't want to say, I mean, I'll, I will hesitate to say a, generally about NBS because it depends on how we define it. You know, so it, you know, it's, it's a relatively new term. Um, there are many terms and there's lots of debates about whether we need a new term or not. And I don't necessarily want to get into that. At the end of the day, I don't, it's not the terminology that matters. It, it, it's, if we take the, the definition, for example, of NBS, that it is in fact place-based for communities, by communities, but also defined by communities, then I guess you could say it's defined in such a way that it is trying to address power. But that's the big question, you know, is the way that it's being promoted now, is the way it's being operationalized actually addressing um, these, these major structural power issues across scales? Um, so it's a great question. I, I would speak it to, to it from more of an academic standpoint of like, where do we need to go in research to address this issue? Because I wouldn't say that the community is blind to it. Obviously, I mean, just in the very setup of this conference, um, they've made a lot of space for different voices to convey um, issues about power, um, but also to have the opportunity to even convey it. So, I mean, the, there, there's, a, there's an awareness there, but what I would suggest as someone who uh, didn't come from the political ecology field is that that actually that field needs a renaissance that needs to be elevated that needs to be be made more accessible in terms of um, reducing the jargon um, investment into improving the methodologies to elevate that to um, 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 better recognition and more publication more more visibility about how to actually measure that and convey that and and um, and you know get that out there because it there's a wealth of knowledge in that field but i just don't see it um, being taken up in a lot of uh, research, so that would—that's what I would suggest. Eric, did you, Eric or Jasper, would you like to to say something? Yeah. Okay. That's for you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, Can I just add to that? Because I do, I do feel like I okay, right. need to respond to that a little bit because I think you know you can, you can question which. You know, why is it that political ecology and, and the case study research I've been talking about is not, you know, necessarily taken up? Is that partly because of all the things that we've been talking about, the structural ways in which conservation policies are being implemented to make that kind of other kinds of knowledge, let alone um, deep long term scientific research that's more ethnographic or based in the field to not count? You know, so I think we have to be a little bit careful. I don't know if the solution is having political ecologists start to resemble, um, you know, the natural scientists or, you know, because of the nature of the issues they're trying to understand. And also I think there needs to be space in these processes as is stated, in, you know, in the um, documents surrounding MBS and other initiatives as well for other forms of, you know, for a diverse form of knowledge, you know, forms of knowledge, you know, not just you know, ethnographies, but obviously indigenous and local knowledge. And so how can we design systems that are able to recognize um, different forms of knowledge? So I do agree that, you know, absolutely political ecologists can do a better job of communicating and there needs to, you know, um, that's a part of it, but I think there has to be space for that. It's this, you know, yeah. I just want to make it clear that I completely agree. <laughs> like that, that I'm not saying- You need, you need the microphone. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm not saying that political ecology itself needs to change, but that there needs to be, uh, people doing ethnographic work, people doing case studies from various different um, epistemologies and design approaches, but that then the in the integrative interdisciplinary sciences, there needs to be more of a, a taking up of that particular discipline in the interdisciplinary sciences. Um, and, and, and and yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Saba, and then we'll have one last, I really time for one last question from the online audience as well. Yeah. So I cannot ask two questions. <laughs> no, one question only. <laughs> okay, one question then. Then I will choose it um, for Eric. Um, can you elaborate, have you been thinking about the 
possible analytical concepts through or analytical lens through which you want to approach your uh, key findings and um, uh, also kind of related to that uh, could you open up on the dimension of recognition kind of recognitional justice or recognition equity or how do you think that um, come to be you know relevant for your for your um, findings thank you um, thank you very much so I think beyond uh, looking at, you know, the issue of devolution and power, um, what is also very important, you know, I this uh, my findings and the work I've done currently can really be, you know, uh, situated very much in the uh, environmental justice framework, because um, a lot of issues around, you know, procedural justice, you know, comes to play, you know, um, for example, I talk about situations where, you know, a number of people are now known as the Kramer people. So it's four or five. Meanwhile, it's a community resource management area. And, and so it's also supposed to be the whole community that gets to have a say and not just four or five people. So I think uh, my work can really, you know, shed a bit more light in terms of that. But also in terms of issues that around recognition, it also has to do a lot with, you know, a lot of values, you know. Um, in the current setup and design um, of the, the CREMES and also, you know, stepping it up all the way to the HI level, um, what you see is that a lot of um, you know scientific information you know a, a lot of um, uh, how do we call it private sector views you know um, it is given more precedence than you know really the views of the, the local communities you know than their values you know the, the key issues that are at the heart of you know um, what they experience I think more light can really you know be, be shed on on this thing so these are all possible uh, ways that I could possibly uh, you know expand a bit uh, on this issue. Uh, I must actually also say that uh, this work is, is still uh, really rather very much ongoing. And so uh, for the participants right now, I cannot share much in terms of publication, but it's something that um, I look to to dive a bit more into uh, in the coming months. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Eric. Um, I don't want to stand in the way of coffee, but I'm aware that we could maybe squeeze in one more quick question from our online participants, and then we'll um, we'll rapidly laugh, close up. Thank you. Um, all right, so I'll try to find a question which can be answered uh, by everyone. Um, it's actually, it's directed to Rachel Garrett, but maybe other can also contribute. It is interesting, uh, Rachel, that you show us the distribution of population density in highly restorable areas. For example, in Indonesia's case, uh, Indonesia's area are yet yellow, but the global corporation concur the most lands in other countries restorable area affected by those people in affected and those people in the marginalization land user how can we achieve the equity and inclusivity you know to address this problem i'm not sure if it's uh, clear enough but yes um, oh, oh sorry <laughs> I, I'm not sure I caught, um, it sounded like there were two dimensions that there's, that I brought up the fact, I was trying to use that as an example of how there's very local issues that clearly need to be addressed when we're defining globally some priority areas for a particular NBS. And um, and so um, those are just places where it's very obvious that if, if people aren't involved, that uh, that you're not gonna have a solution that's uh, permanent even, let alone equitable. And by permanent, I mean, if you plant a tree in a place where nobody wants trees, <laughs> not saying that planting a tree is even a good thing to do conservation wise, but like that that's clearly just a misguided approach. Um, but I think the question was getting at that, that not all problems are local and that maybe uh, there's also global um, actors that would care about what's happening in those particular areas. And, and I think, um, um, maybe the map isn't the best thing to speak to that point because the whole fact that the maps exist and get so much attention to begin with is already a sign that the global actors actually have quite such a say in the issues. And um, and we are, are, I think a lot of people are pushing back on that right now to say, you know, these global maps are invisibilizing the people who actually live there. So I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe perhaps just to you know shed a bit more light on it so um, another part of uh, my research what i do really is um, you know uh, looking at how this uh, uh, you know restoration potential maps are able to you know you know the, the kind of things that they really hide i'm looking at this biofuel case in ghana where you know a, a very european founded company has 
been able to secure, you know, about 82,000 hectares of land, you know, you know, this kind of one of the biggest challenge, like Rachel says, is, you know, th this kind of maps really, you know, sort of, it, it's very blind to, you know, the kind of rights, it's very blind to, you know, the, the living conditions and the kind of, you know, inequities that people in this resource spaces are, are actually exposed to. So, for example, um, in the case that I look at, um, you know, through a, a kind of confluence between traditional authorities, same old traditional authorities again, <laughs> and the state, um, you know, communities who, as it were, had access to these spaces are now, you know, exposed to multiple forms of violence. You know, you've, you've had people die simply because they want to, you know, fight back and, you know, access some of the resources. They are not actually even asking for the land. They just want some of the resources that has actually been, you know, taken from them or as it were essentially stolen from them. So I think, you know, this, and, and, and maybe that also touches a, get a bit more again on, you know, why political ecologists, you know, we also need to do a bit more to, you know, bring more visibility to the kind of, uh, you know, work we do. Um, invariably the global system is such that if you if you do a lot of ethnography work among others it's not given much attention like oh yeah that's that's a very really nice model oh, okay yeah there's much potential there <laughs> so i think we we need to do more and and it's it's a challenge that we are willing to embrace and uh, you know see how best we can contribute thanks great thank you very much um yes yeah, so it's almost time to get a coffee the coffee is back at the museum is that right uh, yeah all around yeah, okay, perfect. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that session. And there were, there were, you know, several threads, I think, that we can follow up on in a number of ways, like challenge to us as researchers, hopefully, for those of you who are practitioners as well. I hope you weren't coming thinking that we were just going to spell out the blueprint for how to do things. Um, but also, the, but the, you know, you've taken away some things to think about to take into the other sessions to kind of critically reflect on nature-based solutions, where are we going, how, how, how are we getting there, what, what you know, just what we think is the kind of central role of governance here in trying to determine the social and environmental influence of these things. Um, so without, um, yeah, so off the coffee, but uh, before then, I'd just like to invite you to um, thank, uh, by way of round of applause, our participants and um, Mary and Jasper. Um, thank you so much for um, coming and, and speaking to us and uh, look forward to seeing you over the rest of the conference. <laughs>